I forgot to do this on the last slide, but see if you remember what you learned about the Byzantines. Go read through the questions and see if you know the answer because I'm not going to tell you. All right, so medieval Europe. Uh, we use the term medieval Europe to talk about the time period between the 5th and 15th centuries where you have the whole feudal system set up. And I'll come talk about that in a minute. And then there's a little box down here that explains how feudalism works. But after the collapse of the western half of the Roman Empire in 476, you pretty much just have all these little Germanic kingdoms in Europe. And they're the successors to the Roman Empire. They ended up, most of them, converting to Christianity and, adopt, and adopting Roman laws. But the most important, successful, influential of all these tribes were the Franks. Um, they're going to start what's called the Carolingian dynasty, which eventually like leads into the Holy Roman Empire. Um, Charles Martel is an important guy. He's going to stop Muslim expanse at the Battle of Tours over in France. And so that keeps the Umayyads that were staying in Spain from expanding into the rest of Europe. His grandson, though, is probably more important. You have Charlemagne. Okay, whose dad was called Pippin the Short, and he was like five foot something, and Charlemagne was like six six, which was really unheard of for the time. Fun fact. So he's going to centralize rule um, within his tribe. He was very, very intelligent. He is keeping really good relationships with the Byzantines and the Abbasids. He realizes the importance of trade and maintaining good diplomatic relationships with everybody. He has officials that are in his empire. He's traveling his kingdom. He was one of these rulers who dressed in normal clothes and went out and met with the people to see what they were doing and what they needed and how he could help. And he's really, really proactive in promoting education. And so in the year 800, on Christmas Day, he is crowned emperor of the Carolingian Empire, which eventually becomes the Holy Roman Empire. And when he dies 43 years later, um, his empire... Um, ends up getting divided among his successors. But Charlemagne, important guy in kind of helping to start stabilizing Western Europe. So part of the problem with Western Europe and why it was so disstable, unstable, was you had the Vikings. The Vikings were feared by the people of Europe um, because they, there were some who would raid and pillage and that's not all Vikings, but that's like the stereotype that you get for them. The Vikings more specifically were the Nordic people of Scandinavia, excellent seafarers. And most of them were merchants who were seeking out commercial opportunities. Um, they sailed up the river into Europe, in the Mediterranean, into Russia. They sound, founded trading cities in Russia. So overall, they're not bad people, but you do have the ones who like to kill and raid and pillage and plunder and all that stuff. And so that's where you get the stereotype of the Gurmean Vikings. All right. So on to feudalism, which is the political structure of the Middle Ages. You have small local populations that were able to sustain themselves. Europe remained mostly rural. So you have feudalism that pops up, like I said, which is the political system, but it also kind of sets up your rank in society. You have lords who were like in control of like the little kingdoms and then they become kings. And then, so you have the king at the top who was crowned, owned all the land in the country. He made the laws, all that, all that other good stuff. Below him, you had nobles and you had lords. And what they would do is they would agree to serve the king and supply the king with soldiers and all that other kind of stuff. So then the lords would have land because they were loyal to the king. Then you had the knights and these were your soldiers who fought for the nobles and the king. And then eventually they would get, they were granted land. And then you have the poor little peasants who worked the land for the nobles and knights 
Um, they were offered protection and pretty much they were serfs. And a serf is pretty much a slave. Like once you were a serf, you could never ever really get out of it. So wasn't the best thing to be a part of. All right, let me, because I don't remember what the order of these were, investiture. Okay, so let me talk about the plague. The plague was a virus that, in, that infects rodents, which is then transferred by fleas. So it's not the poor little fleas fault, it's the rat's fault, and it's just the little fleas that help spread the disease. It was spread from China along the trade routes. Um, it's going to reach the Mediterranean region of Europe, by 1347 and most of western europe was afflicted by 1348 and this is the bubonic plague this is the one where you get the nice little buboes that are like the size of eggs or apples and um, the swelling in your lymph nodes if you contracted the plague it had anywhere between a 60 to 70 percent mortality rate not something fun to die of and we'll talk more about that in class all right so I talked about Charlemagne in the Carolingian Empire. And so when he was crowned, that's going to kind of start the Holy Roman Empire in 800. It's going to last to 1806. So it's around for a while. Um, you have Otto of Saxony, who establishes himself as king of northern Germany, goes and conquers parts of Italy and kind of helps like expand the empire. In appreciation later on of all he does, then you have the Pope proclaiming him emperor of the not holy, not Roman, and not an empire, holy Roman empire. That's how John Green refers to it, so we'll get used to that. But anyway, the thing that they ne you need to know about them is the investiture controversy, where you would have the ruler try to appoint church officials and because they wanted people who would help out what they wanted. And so the, the emperor would try to appoint bishops and stuff like that. And so the Pope ended up putting it into that. Another thing to know um, from this time period, that Hansa, and I'll come back to Hansa in a second, is that Europe does start to revive itself. Um, another important person that you need to know is William the Conqueror, who was the Duke of Normandy. And in 1066, he invaded England unified it and started introducing Norman principles of government, which is going to kind of help lead to the stability of England. So as far as revival, you have new crops coming into Europe, um, like beans, new technologies like the horse collar, you have urbanization happening and textile productions. And so all of this is really, really, really going to help um, with the growth of Europe. So the revival of urban society was most pronounced in Italy. They start reviving Mediterranean trade. They're introducing new trade in the Baltic and the North Sea region, which is going to be or going to lead to the development of the Hanseatic League or Hansa. And it was an association of trade cities. And so they made sure, you know, that thing, everyone was represented and that trade was pretty much stable. And then that's going to lead to the development of guilds, which regulated the production in the sale of goods. So they really, really start to organize themselves as far as trade is concerned. You do start to see more and more conflicts with Islam. As Europe becomes stronger, they begin clashing with Muslims. From 1060 to 1492, you have the Reconquista, which is taking place in Spain. And that is where the Christians are trying to overthrow the Muslims that have been entrenched there with the Umayyad dynasty. So that takes a while. Um, 1095 starts the Crusades. They are called for by Pope Urban II. So Crusades, important. Um, it's a series of political and religious campaigns where Christians are trying to go recapture the Holy Land from Muslims. Saladin was the leader of the Muslim forces in the Middle East. He was a very good um, military strategist, so you need to know people on, on both sides. Really, when we talk about the Crusades, people only ever really talk about the First, Second, and Third Crusades. There's lots of them. 
if it 